Good to go. Okay, sounds good. Um, if everyone would go ahead and unmute for just a moment, can I get a kind of a survey on was anybody here last time, or should I uh, include some of the material that uh, uh, that I covered last time? It just if you if you're new to Charlemagne, it would be awful to kind of throw you in the deep end without any kind of grounding, but if we were all here last time, um, then we can kind of pick up where we were last time. In the chat, anything, anybody? Oh well, um, looks like we'll be kind of picking up where we left off. And what I'd like to do is because last time we talked a lot about uh, the individual characters and some of their origin myths, um, they really weren't myths. They were uh, they were chansons. They were um, heroicized histories. Um, what was what was happening is that um, chivalric culture was largely largely illiterate. Um, while there was obviously um, literacy in the Middle Ages, even in the early Middle Ages, the chivalric class treated literacy uh, the way that we would treat the practice of law. You had a specialist come do that for you. Um, if you had a letter to dictate, you had people for that. Um, if you had records that needed to be kept, you weren't going to do that yourself. You had people to fight and lands to manage. Um, and so the stories that they told each other were their own histories and the, uh, the practice of poetry, although literacy was, um, what? Literacy was considered specialized knowledge. Um, the, the poetry and wordplay were absolutely very common and well respected um, and they always have been poetry is probably the oldest um, of human arts poetry and song um, they really go together and so the uh the chanson the songs of uh the heroes of charlemagne's time were the histories that the knightly classes on the continent told each other and these were very different than the legendarium around Arthur. Um, the, the, like, the story of Gawain the Green Knight, uh, the story of Lancelot and Galahad, uh, the story of Arthur's birth and rise as a king, those were all stories. Those were prose, they were legends, uh, they were not poetic songs. Um, in on the continent, they were telling their histories in song. It was um, it was just different. That was that was how it happened. And uh, as a consequence, well, I'll, I'll put it to you this way: How many knights sat around the round table? Usually fifty or a hundred. But there were a lot of them. And we know a lot of them um, because no one had to construct a poem to tell us about it. I mean, we can, we know there's, we know things that Sir Kay did. We know things that Bedivere did. We know things that, uh, sorry, Arthurian history is not my forte, but there are minor characters in Arthurian legend that still have um, a, a fairly well-developed legendarium because they just got reused as minor background characters. But when you're telling a, a, a song, when you're recounting history in a song, there's only a few characters that get used. And so we don't have an awful lot of characters in 
um, Carolingian legend. Um, uh, I'll show you a few. We, uh, there are a few, obviously. Um, we, we do have one request for a brief summary of part one. Okay. Uh, well, this is, a, this is a good way to lead off to it. Um, how to screen share. Should be on the bottom. You should have the option to share screen. There you go. How's that? Perfect. Okay. Um, Charlemagne was did not uh, live his life known as Charlemagne. Uh, Charlemagne is a Frankified corruption of Carolus Magnus, uh, the Latin form of the name that Charlemagne used. Um, he was Carl, uh, perhaps not Carl, more like Carl. Uh, that's thus uh, Carolus, or uh, you, you can you can tell how we got uh, how we got Charles from Carl. Or, uh, and how the French got Charles. Uh, but anyway, Carl, King Carl was eventually uh, crowned emperor at the end of his life. But in Carolingian legend, always the emperor. He is always Kaiser. Uh, he is crowned emperor, at least uh, according to the uh, Carl Magnus Saga, uh, about a year later, after he was crowned king. So very early on in his life. And uh, the Battle of Rocheville Pass is, of course, the, the end of this, the saga of Charlemagne. Uh, but that actually happened when he was about 35. So, oh well. But Sh Charlemagne is uh, the Christian conquering king. He is the, the central figure of like where it is if uh, Arthur is the wise king uh, who uh, who unifies the kingdom and gives it a period of, of the golden age, then Charlemagne is the conquering king uh, and the defender of the faith. Uh, he became the model that every king who took up the crusade or wanted to. Uh, they tried to stamp themselves in his mold for a thousand years. Um, they, they even, they, they knelt at the altar where he knelt. They sat in the throne where he was crowned. They, it, was, it was a big deal. They crowned themselves with, uh, with his sword. Um, as that is the, the axis of legend, um, he can't always present one face to the audience. Um, he comes in three faces, and these are all come from life. Um, he is a victorious hero and defender of Christianity. Uh, he is also a monarch in need, provides opportunity uh, for valorous youths to advance themselves. Um, if Charlemagne needs something done. It will be Roland who reaps the glory, uh, or Oliver, or uh, Reynolds, or Huon, or whomever. Uh, but he is also the tyrant uh, who imposes law on a disordered world uh, against which knights must both struggle when they are unjustly caught in the gears of civilization uh, and ultimately come to terms with it as well. Uh, he is stop sharing. Let's do this again. Share screen.
you've all heard of Roland. Everyone has heard of Roland. Roland is probably the second most famous um, fictional knight in the world. The second only to Lancelot. Uh, in period, he may have even been, been more famous than Lancelot, but Lancelot had about a two century start on, uh, on Roland. He is, uh, his character is, if you are familiar with the Iliad, he's Achilles. He's the Christian Achilles. Uh, he is the embodiment of every vice and virtue of chivalry. Uh, to his friends, he is um, the model of courtesy, of kindness, of generosity. Uh, he, is, he is every inch a gentleman. And to anyone who opposes him, he is a, he's a dick. Yeah. Um, now, if you are in combat with your enemies, that's fine. But if you find someone on your own side whom you mislike um, and treat them as an enemy, overtly, there will be problems. And Roland does that in spades. Um, he carries a magic sword. Uh, in Arthurian legend, there were perhaps two magic swords. There was Excalibur and uh, I forget the name of the red sword that uh, Galahad drew from the drew from the second stone. I don't remember, um, but they weren't very common in Arthurian legend. But they are almost as common as. Uh, I don't know. They're, they are very common in Carolingian legend. Um, there's Durandal, uh, which is the uh, second most famous magic sword. Probably. Probably. Um, Durandal is variously described as uh, was made by Wayland the Smith. Uh, Wayland is a figure from mostly Finnish, but generally Germanic folk legend as being a mortal smith, but he was, uh, he learned how to smith magically and he was the greatest smith who ever lived. So like Waylon and Vulcan are basically the same character with different window dressing. Uh, so Durandal was uh, made by Waylon or Durandal was delivered down by, from heaven by the hand of an angel containing the relics of six or seven different saints. Uh, or Durandal was simply purchased from a Jewish arms merchant. Seriously, that, that happened. <laughs> um, but so many, many different, uh, there, if you think comic book history is um, all over the place and hard to figure out a common narrative running through it, Imagine uh, this is comic book history set over a thousand years of fan fiction. That's, that's what we're dealing with here. Everybody has six or seven different origin stories, and six or seven different uh, versions of details. But Durandal, you can always say, um, never breaks. That's, that is the magic of Durandal. Durandal doesn't break, no matter what, no matter what you hit it against, no matter how hard you hit it, no matter how hard you try to break it, Durandal never breaks. Um, it's part of the name. Uh, he also carried the magic horn, Oliphant. Um, Oliphant has a couple of different origins. Uh, there are real Oliphants. Uh, in fact, I think I might have a picture of them. Um, While you're looking for the picture, we have a question in the chat. Yeah, sure. It says, on the topic of magical swords, is Charlemagne's sword considered to be one, or is yes. it seen more as a mundane sword that embodies nine? Kingship. Sorry, the chat closed as you shared the screen. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. Uh, no, it was absolutely magical. Joyous was magical. Yes. Um, but anyway, this is Holy Font. Um, this is said to be Roland's Oliphant. Um, 
it actually comes from the 10th century. So Roland would have lived in the uh, the eighth. Yeah, he would have died at the end of the eighth century. But still, this this is an olifant horn. It is a horn carved from the tusk of an elephant. That is what an olifant is. And there are several in the Middle Ages. Um, Screen sharing has stopped. Yes, good. Screen sharing needs to stop. Um, but yeah, uh, Charlemagne's sword was joyous. And let me see if I can find it for you. Huh. Well, joyous is famous. I'm sure you've all seen, you know, the, the sword of the kings of France or Charlemagne's sword. Um, it was rehilted in the 18th century in the 1700s, I think. Yeah, in, uh, in the classical style. But the blade is that old. It very well may have been Charlemagne's sword. Certainly, it was an old sword before it began being used as a coronation sword in the 12th century, the 1100s. Now, the 1100s is significantly later than 800 when Charlemagne lived. Anyway, um, where were we? Uh, oh, uh, to Roland. Um, so the oldest song that we have, the only oldest chanson is the Chanson de Roland. Uh, the, the Chanson de Roland is a, uh, a heroicized retelling of the Spanish campaign. Um, let me pick out some of the high points. The Lord of Zaragoza is very concerned that Lord of Zaragoza is very concerned that um, a Muslim army from Morocco is about to land in Spain. And while they have been largely autonomous for over 100 years, uh, they're about to lose that autonomy. And so uh, much like several Christian kingdoms would do in the uh, early Renaissance, uh, these autonomous Muslim leaders were inviting Christian kings in to be the their protector and overlord. Um, so Zaragoza invited Charlemagne into Spain to stave off um, the loss of his auto autonomy from uh, their overlords across the Mediterranean. But by the time Charlemagne got there, the army from across the Mediterranean had already gotten into Spain. So um, the deal was off. Um, Charlemagne and uh, the Franks felt very betrayed, and so they campaigned against both the uh, Moroccan armies and the, shall we call them native Spanish? Native Moorish um, overlords and or, uh, existing overlords, uh, Moorish nobility. Yes, they warred against the, the foreign Moroccans and the Moorish nobility um, because they felt betrayed. And uh, when the uh, the siege of Saragossa is unsuccessful, Charlemagne retreats. Uh, Besides, they call it a day because there are other things to do. Um, he, is, uh, he has conflicts in Italy that he has to settle, and he, his army is needed elsewhere. And so he retreats out of Spain, and the um, Christian army is ambushed by um, by an army of unhappy Basques. 
Now, uh, uh, modern historians like to play up the fact that it was the Basques who beat Charlie. The Basques certainly like to remind us that it was they who beat Charlemagne. And they say, oh, it was the, they, they say it was the Muslims. Well, the Basques as a culture group, <clears throat> the Basques were Basques first. Um, elsewhere in Christendom, especially in Germany, France, Italy, um, Greece, Christians were Christian first, and then whatever ethnic group later. Uh, this is this was centuries before um, the East-West schism. Um, so, well, Christians were Christians. We're all on the same team. The Basques said, "We are Basques. We are all on the same team. Christians, Muslims, pagans. We are still Basques." And so, on the northern side of the Pyrenees, that was where the Christian Basques lived, and as far as they told anyone else, we're Basques, we're all Christians here. The Muslim Basques lived on the southern side of the Pyrenees, and as far as they told any of the Muslims in Spain, we are all Muslims here. And there were pagans up in the mountains, and it was rather fluid um, where we consider and have considered for centuries being picking your faith as a permanent life choice um, like a conversion event would be a, a monumental change in your life and lifestyle um, you could lose friends and family over a significant conversion event um, that was also very true in the heartlands of Islam, in the heartlands of Christendom, but on the borders, it wasn't quite as big a deal. People were known to switch from uh, from pagan to Christian. Uh, I'm a pagan warrior. There's a lot of things that are good for me to do and seem awfully fun, but towards the end of my life, the Christian narrative of the afterlife is rather compelling. I think I'll be baptized, have all my sins forgiven. I'm done with that anyway, and then I can go live the end of my life as a Christian holy man. Uh, or alternately, uh, there are advantages to being Muslim. Uh, notably, the acceptance of having many wives if you can afford them. Uh, so someone a young man might decide okay i will be muslim and then perhaps there might be something to that christ fellow maybe not um but the conversion events both in the pyrenees on the, the the border of christianity and islam and also in the far well not far the middle east the northern middle east um uh in uh, in the steppes, um, yeah, you see this in, in Magyar culture in uh, early on that when the, the steppe peoples were uh, sending for Catholic priests, they sent for Orthodox priests, they would send for Muslim imams, uh, they would send for Buddhist monks because they were going to decide uh, what their tribe should be in the future. Uh, their old gods are no longer good enough. Let's look for other successful gods. Uh, so I say all that to say that no, it really was Muslims attacking the end of Charlemagne's uh, army train and wiping out Rome in the 12 years of France or whatever their true historic analog was. Um, it just happened to be there were Muslim masks. Uh, but that, that event was caught in the line of um, the, that, that, that valorous defense against impossible odds stuck in the medieval mind. And the, the character of Roland, um, 
who grew out of the historic Count Krugman um, as the exemplar of all of the chivalric ideals that that caught in the mind um, and his his best friend and shield companion Oliver that caught in the mind and so they weren't content to just let the Chanson de Roland go they weren't content to let it be on its own they needed more songs and so they started singing them and um, more songs were sung about Oliver uh, and Roland and Charlemagne himself and Archbishop Turpin. Uh, let's start up oh, Archbishop Turpin. Um, share a screen. Let's look at Turpin. Um, Archbishop Turpin, uh, this was long before um, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, kind of put the final nail in the coffin on priests in combat. Uh, because if priests are following the example of St. Peter, um, it's kind of a mixed message. St. Peter carried a sword. And St. Peter was also admonished by Christ for using the sword. Well, was he admonished for using the sword at all or for resisting the law unjustly? Um, and so there was, in the early church, there was a debate about that, and especially from the members of the chivalric nobility who were uh, coming into positions of leadership in the church. There was, um, well, there was a desire to still be a chivalric person. And if, uh, if members, of the, members of the clergy were essentially parallel landed nobility, well, then they had obligations as landed nobility to defend their people. Um, and so there are, there are pretty good examples from the, the high Middle Ages, or no, early Middle Ages into the high Middle Ages um, of uh, bishops standing on a battle line with like battle axes um, and dying in battle. Um, so this was, this was not beyond the pale as it would be today. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, said that the, oh, what did he say about, about militant priests? That said, he said that the, um, the calling of a priest was to deal with matters of the divine. And so anything um, secular that took them away from their um, sacred responsibilities was um, unjustified, not their proper station. And so um, you might think that's a uh, fairly mild uh, condemnation of uh, priestly violence, I suppose. But um, Thomas Aquinas was so monumentally influential but that just ended the conversation right there. But obviously this is, geez, five centuries previous uh, to that. So uh, Archbishop Turpin had a magical sword, the sword almes. Almes means alms, um, or it might mean almighty, but it probably means alms or alms giver. Um, and he was a, uh, he was the Archbishop of, of Turin, uh, no, excuse me, Archbishop of Rhymes, Archbishop of Rhymes. Um, and in Charlemagne's court, he was a, a voice of reason, of clemency, of good judgment. Um, his best friend was Duke Naaman, who was basically the nester of Carolingian legend, always the, the wise elder. Um, 
And Turpin would never raise his hand against a Christian opponent, even in Charlemagne's wars against uh, rebellious nobles and, um, uh, well, rival kings before they became his nobles as he assembled his empire. Um, Turpin was always a, a mediator. But in the wars against uh, wars against the heathens, um, nope, he took up the sword. Um, we didn't talk about the wars of the heathens. We didn't talk about that last time. Um, most of Charlemagne's campaigns were. Um, were against European pagans, European heathens. Yes, I think that's the way to put it. Uh, we remember Charlemagne as campaigning against the Moors in Spain. Obviously, that's the Song of Rome. And later chansons did not help with that perception at all because they, they recount uh, the uh, Moorish invasions of France, of which there were several. Uh, they recounted the Moorish invasion and sack of Rome. Um, they were the relevant uh, threat of the time, of course. But uh, not in Charlemagne's time. It was the, the Saxons under Wittekind. who were the primary occupation and antagonist of the middle of Charlemagne's life. The wars against the Saxons, there were, I think, three of them, uh, lasting six and 10 years. Um, and then I don't remember. I know there was a six year and a 10 year war against the Saxons. <clears throat> and, uh, the Saxons were defeated. Uh, Wittekind did his best to create a, um, a unified pagan response to um, militant Christianity under Charlemagne. And he did a very good job too. Um, but Wittekind was defeated, and legend has it that Wittekind himself converted to Christianity. In fact, um, he is considered the blessed Wittekind and a builder of churches. Um, that's, that's not what I would have expected until I ran across that myself a couple of days ago. Um, Wittekind, um, the, the story goes that in their last campaign into Saxony, that Wittekind disguised himself as a beggar and he was um, spying on Charlemagne's army. And at one point he saw um, a priest uh, conducting mass. And Wittekind listened to him preach, he was not impressed listen to them read the scriptures, didn't care. But then it came time for the Eucharist and Wittekind saw a priest handing a beautiful child to each of the participants of the mass, to all of the congregation handing a baby to you, a baby to you, a baby to you. And he was mystified. And uh, so much so that he stayed watching for much longer than he should have. He was actually recognized. And the, the legend said that he was recognized because of um, either deformity of his hand or um, he may have been missing digits in a very um, notable fashion. And so they recognized that you're a Whittigan. And he was captured and taken to uh, Charlemagne. And he recounted what he saw. And that was an unusual story, even to believing Christians at the time. So they brought um, 
priests. Uh, not Archbishop Turpin, because he is a figure of legend. I do not believe that Turpin himself um, existed as such. But they, they summoned priests and they said, uh, no, we believe he's actually had a, uh, had, a, had a vision and that was his conversion event. And um, thereafter, Wittekind, instead of being the, the greatest um, antagonist of Christianity in Germany, became its greatest advocate. And he um, helped Charlemagne cut down sacred oaks and build churches in their places and uh, led to the conversion of Germany as a whole, greater Germany. Um, uh, it's even said that he went um, east to um, found churches in the land of the Avars. Um, the Avars were one of the groups that uh, came westward with the Huns. Uh, the Avars settled in Austria-Hungary, basically. Uh, Charlemagne wiped them out as a culture group. Um, the wars against the Avars were uh, cataclysmic for that civilization. There was nothing left of the Avars after Charlemagne. Um, that became the Ostreich, Austria. Uh, Austria was founded by Charlemagne as the eastern side of the Frankish, of, of Frankreich. Um, and uh, yeah, it's the Wittekind, this, this pagan warlord, was building churches in Austria. Uh, there are uh, I forget where Wittekind's tomb is. There is a, a tomb associated with Wittekind that, uh, um, and a lot of this is uh, like folk beatification, folk uh, hagiography. Um, not all of this made its way back to Rome to become uh, official. Uh, like Simon de Montfort in England was considered a folk saint and if it hadn't been so politically, um, what, inflammatory? Yes, politically inflammatory. It's likely that Simon de Montfort would have become a saint. But since he was a rebel against the King of England, we kind of swept that one under the rug. But it didn't stop the folk hagiography from venerating Simon de Montfort in the middle of England. Well, likewise, in the middle of Germany, um, peasants considered Wittekind to be, um, no, they did not actually sink him, but he was considered to be uh, beatified, uh, to, be, to be blessed. Um, that's, there's, there's, there's levels of sainthood. There, there's your venerable, like if you've heard of the, the venerable bead, the historian in uh, Anglo-Saxon Anglo England, the Venerable Bede. Uh, then there is the Blessed, and then there is finally the Sainted, uh, is canonized. Um, so, venerated, beatified, canonized. Um, where were we? Oh, uh, we had just talked about Roland. Let's talk about Roland's best friend. Let's look at that. Open, please. Great. Screen share. You. There we go. Poor Oliver. Uh, Oliver is the French metropolis. Uh, he is Roland's sensible best friend. He is uh, valorous. He is a fantastic knight he is always, 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 always upstaged by Roland. If he has a legend where he does anything cool himself, then Roland will have a later legend where he does something cooler uh, and almost identical that will be made maybe 20 years later. Um, the, uh, the obvious one is the legend of Farah Ross. Um, Farah Ross is okay. Stop it. Aha, yes. Uh, 
Yes. There we go. This is Oliver and Fira Ross. Fira Ross uh, literally means strong arm. Uh, he was a Saracen giant uh, who <laughs> sacked Rome. Um, he was the, the son of the general um, and said to be 15 feet tall sometimes. Other times he was just as strong as 10 men. And um, when Charlemagne's army marched south to fight the, uh, the Moorish uh, army of invasion, uh, Ferebras challenged any Christian knight in a single combat, and he was knocking them down one after the other, after the other, after the other. And finally, Oliver was there, and he fought Ferebras in single combat, and uh, he finally won. Uh, amazingly, after I think, let's see, how did the battle go? I think it was they fought for for six hours without uh, without rest, and then they were so tired that they both got off their horses and they sat down and they uh, had lunch uh, opposite each other. You know, in they're talking about how cool that fight was, and. Uh, Eventually, they got back up on their horses and fought more until the sun dipped. And finally, at the end of the day, Oliver unhorsed Ferebras, and uh, he was victorious, and the Muslim army withdrew. And then Ferebras had uh, a vision of, think a vision of the Virgin Mary. And uh, then he approached the Christian army on his own. Uh, the next day, and he said uh, something like, uh, I wish to be baptized and follow him who died on the cross. And then Ferros was welcomed with open arms, he was baptized, he was made a Christian, and very quickly became another one of the 12 peers of France, if that phrase actually means anything, because the 12 peers of France is like... Uh, Like saying the best knights in France, or the like greatest knights of the round table. What what exactly is that group? It's not exactly a a a concrete uh, number of people that you can get your get your arms around. But regardless, Oliver had a really cool story where he was getting to fight a really cool bad guy who he later turned into a good guy. That was great. It was, it was an awesome story for Oliver. And then Roland fought Farragut. Um, Farragut was a, also a Muslim giant. And unlike Ferros, Farragut couldn't be harmed by mortal weapons. So ha 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 His enemy is tougher. And um, Farragut... Uh, Roland uh, had a similar single combat against Farragut, where they uh, fought all day and then laid down in the field uh, conversing with each other overnight and then got up the next day and fought again. But in their conversation that night, there was, a, again, a friendly conversation. Farragut boasted that he could not be harmed by mortal weapons, and the only way that uh, any harm could come to him would be for the weapon to pass through his navel, uh, because that was his the only weakness of his body. Um, and of course, Roland, armed with this knowledge, well, thank you, bad guy, for telling me your weakness. Um, he is finally able to pierce Farragut's armor and drive his lance directly into Farragut's navel, and Farragut dies. Although not for long, because he was also a cool enemy and he was recycled into later stories. So every time that Oliver does something cool, Roland has to do something cooler. It's like Dragon Ball Z. If Gohan does something cool, well, obviously Goku has to do something cooler. We can't just leave someone doing something cool without Gohan having, or Goku having a, a response for it. 
it was exactly that way in the Middle Ages. So uh, unfortunately, by the late Middle Ages, Oliver got boring. Everybody knew that Oliver dies in Rome. And so there's, the story has a set ending. Um, and they already know that Oliver can never be as cool as Roland is. And so they just stopped using him in stories. Uh, when it came time to um, Orlando Inamorato and uh, Orlando Furioso, which were the, the uh, culmination of um, Carolingian legend, uh, Oliver was basically not a character at all. He had been substituted by, by Reynolds, um, who had been made Roland's cousin by that point. So, best friend, uh, you can't say don't be best friend because he was, he was really cool. He was like Patroclus. Patroclus was, was a hero in his own right, but he is nothing compared to Achilles. Well, Oliver was nothing compared to Roland. So, um, other heroes who didn't have to be nothing compared to Roland were built up over time and eventually eclipsed him as figures of myth. Now let's talk about the, the figures who, who did eclipse him. Um, and that was Reynolds. This was, this is probably the most unlikely origin for for enduring heroic figures ever. The, the, the four sons of Aemon uh, is Reynolds, Rickard, Allard, and Giscard. And um, their, their song, their, their song, the, the Chanson de, de Quatre Fields Aemon, um, it was a tragedy. It was a tragedy. They were, they were brave but doomed victims of an uncaring king. They were, they were going to be ground into dust by the application of, of imperial law. Um, how it started is that Amon was a, and he was duke. Um, he had very few lands of his own. He had Dordogne. Uh, and Dordogne, Dordogne did, does not exist. There is a place called Dordogne, which does exist. It is not the place referenced in the Chanson because Dordogne was founded at, after the, the myths were in circulation. It was uh, much like Montauban. Uh, there is a Montauban in France. Uh, it was founded in the 12th century, referencing the legendary Montauban fortress of, of Reynolds. But anyway, the, so Duke Eamon had four sons and he sends them to court. And the oldest is Reynolds and his three younger brothers. And they all do very, very well in the tournament. In fact, Reynolds wins it. Um, Reynolds winning the tournament is one of the sources of him uh, having uh, gained the magical horse Bayard, uh, who is a, a fantastically strong beast. And in later legend is also able to size change so that it can magically is large enough to hold four armored knights and leap across valleys and clear castle walls. And he's an amazing horse. He's a really big deal. Uh, and so being the celebrated victor of the tournament, uh, Reynolds is invited into court and uh, he is invited to play a game of chess with uh, a prince. And this prince is sometimes uh, Charlemagne's nephew. Uh, it's not Basil, but it's, it starts to be. Uh, sometimes it's Charlemagne's son, Louis. Um, and Reynolds wins the chess game. And the spoiled brat of the prince says that 
um, it is impossible that you could have beaten me without cheating, therefore you are a cheat. He throws over the table and takes the chessboard and throws it into Reynolds' face. Reynolds has just been, his honor has impugned, been impugned and his body has been assaulted. He has a belted knight, which shall leave no blow unanswered. So he draws his sword and splits the prince's head open. May have been uh, that, that may have been somewhat undiplomatic of him. You get that a lot in chivalric literature. Uh, but he was accused of cheating and he was just assaulted, so that's exactly what he did. And Charlemagne was understandably vexed with the situation. His nephew, or perhaps his son, having been murdered in broad daylight in his own court. Um, and so he orders that the brothers be arrested, but they jump on the back of the magical horse and they flee from Paris, um, jumping over the walls of the city and they run back to Dordogne. And Charlemagne follows the army, he flattens their castle and they're able to escape. And they find a, uh, a castle in the, the wilderness called Montauban, and they live there for a number of years, and finally Charlemagne catches up with him again, and uh, Montauban is about to be flattened, and the um, inhabitants are about to be all put to the sword, and Roland um, imposes on the king and says, uh, they're, they're valiant knights, give them clemency. And so Charlemagne does, uh, they surrender, um, Charlemagne demands the magical horse as the price for their freedom, and he sends Reynolds off on pilgrimage, where he dies. The end. But the the tale of the the, the brave brothers was so influential on the medieval imagination that they completely rewrote the ending. They're like, no, that's not how it ends. That's not how it ends at all. Because then there's, there's other adventures that they need to go on. And so um, the, the retconning is that instead of um, Charlemagne flattening Montauban and taking Bayard and sending him off on crusade, that he pardons them and uh, he leaves them to survive in Montauban which was in the Pyrenees, right on the border of Christendom, and all of the other outcasts and uh, people falsely accused and uh, who just don't fit well in the, in the civilization that Charlemagne is starting to, to build in, uh, in the Frank-like, um, they all go down to Montauban and they have this, this cool castle of outlaw heroes living on the, the borders of civilization. And whenever there's an incursion by the, by the pagans to the south, they're right there. They're on the front lines fighting the pagans. And that was, that was the, the basis of dozens more legends about Reynolds and his four brothers. Reynolds quickly became the, the star of the show was originally the four brothers, and then it became Reynolds and also some brothers. Um, and in, in legend, they're like, well, how did Reynolds get all of this cool stuff that allowed him to do all of the stuff that he did? Well, he had a cousin, an older cousin, who was a sorcerer. <laughs> so here's Magus, the Christian Belted Knight Sorcerer. Let me screen share this. Um, I don't even know where this came from. Uh, usually Christianity has this big problem with magic, but you know, in Arthurian legend, there is Merlin, and he has no particular trouble with the church. And in Carolingian legend, there is Malgris, and he has no particular trouble with the church. They are perfectly accepted and useful seeming parts of this 
semi-magical legendary court. So, uh, yeah, I think Margus is probably our first, uh, what would you say, Spellblade? Yeah, Spellblade. Um, as a child, he was uh, adopted by Orion, Lady and Fairy. Uh, and taught to do magic. Um, and with these magical powers, um, he was is able to, to cast sleep upon people, is able to uh, enchant objects with fire, he is able to uh, make objects move of their own accord. Uh, and uh, with these magical powers, he caught and tamed magical horse Bayard um, who was living as kind of a uh, almost a nature spirit in the Ardon, the, uh, the great forest in uh, northeastern France. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he had adventures with Bayard on his own uh, but he uh, would he had the gift of foretelling. He knew that his cousin Reynolds would need this magical horse. Um, stop share and screen share something else. Yes, instead. Yeah, this is also, uh, this is Margris right here, uh, riding. All right. Stop that. I don't know why it changed on me. There we go. Anyway, uh, this is Magris on Bayard. Um, although Bayard doesn't seem to be a gigantic horse here, um, he obviously is in um, in uh, in other depictions. Um, and this is Flamberge. Now, we're not sure where. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it is in a legend somewhere. It's just that there are so many of them, I haven't had time to read them, and they're not all in English, so I kind of have to translate as I go uh, sometimes. Um, but yeah, he came up with this the magical sword, Flamberge. Originally, the, the oldest um, name for the sword is Froberge, which, which means like large or sturdy. But um, somehow it became Flamberge. Um, so the later legends said that Flamberge could actually burst into flame and um, you know, basically be a medieval lightsaber. That's, that's how cool Flamberge was. But only when Malgris was using it. Uh, when it was given to Reynolds, um, also something that he passed on for his cousin because he knew his cousin would need it. It was just a very large, magnificent sword. Um, but he had another magic sword. Um, he also erected the fortress of Montauban overnight um, because the story needed him to. Um, he also sent a, uh, what, a boat without oars across the Mediterranean to deliver, uh, so was he delivering Roland or was he delivering Reynolds? He might have been delivering Reynolds um, across the, the Mediterranean because he'd been, he lost a wizard's duel and he was compelled, so he did. Um, it, don't expect a lot of logic. Uh, these are, if, if comic book logic is not great logic, chanson logic is worse. It, it is worse. Comic book logic is superior to chanson logic. Don't, don't question it, just go with it. Uh, rule of cool. Um, but you have a belted knight who's also a wizard who gets to use a flaming sword sitting on a shape-changing giant horse how cool is that? 
Um, oh, let's see. Oh, this is cool. Um, Share the screen again. This has nothing to do with Malgris, but it does have th something to do with the magic sword. This is um, called Le Breche de la Roland, uh, Roland's Breach, or Roland's Pass. It is a gap in the Pyrenees Mountains, um, formed naturally, but um, at the end of the Battle of Rocheville Pass, Roland hadn't died. Uh, this kind of Roland's thing. He couldn't die by, by mortal wounds, let's say. He'd accumulate an endless number of wounds and he wouldn't die. He could only die because of his own exertion, over, his own overexertion. So after the end of the battle, Roland was walking around, kind of looking like a dead man walking but still not dead. And so one of the things that they said Roland did uh, was that he tried to break Durandil because he didn't want it to be captured by the heathens. So he beats it against rocks and he beats it against all kinds of things, trying to, to, to break it or to, to seed it in the stone and he can't do it. Um, and so eventually he, you know, he sets it down on the ground and he lays down and dies on top of it so that his body hides the sword. Well, one of the things that was later attributed to Roland was that, uh, well, this sword can't, can't be cut or can't, can't break. Um, and it broke all kinds of rocks as Roland was trying to break it. Um, well, Roland walked to the edge of the Pyrenees and he struck Durandal against the mountains and created this massive breach in the mountains so that he could look one last time upon France, on the fields of France before he died. And that's Roland's breach. It's, it's, that's a, it's a very cool place. Let me see if I can find a, um, yeah, here it is. There it is. Right here. So uh, it's kind of dramatic. And you can see, because this is France here. This is the, the French side. And so um, what a dramatic story that, that Roland makes his way to the edge of the Pyrenees and he splits the mountains himself. And he's able to look upon the forests and valleys of France at his homeland before falling to the ground dead. Don't think about it too much. Uh, Rocheville Pass is 20 miles back that way. Don't, don't worry about it. Pay no attention to the geography behind the curtain. Uh, Rocheville Pass, incidentally, um, is this. This is Rocheville Pass. The, uh, the Franks would have been coming up this way. You know, if you translate Rancheville, uh, it means Bramble Valley. So you can kind of see how an army hidden in the trees up here and up here could have made a hell of an ambush at uh, the Battle of Bramble Valley Pass. Is this another one? Uh, it's another pretty picture, uh, also of Northland Pass. Uh, from another direction, the uh, original shot was from up here, uh, looking down. This is uh, from the, the end of Northland Pass. This is on the, the French side. I mean, it's still in Spain. It is on the French side of the uh, French facing side of the mountain, I suppose. France is back here. It's more Spain is back there. 
Just look at this. These are ladies of the fairy uh, attending the birth of Ogier the Dane. Ogier the Dane was an opponent of Charlemagne. Um, he was a Dane, as his name indicated, um, and his son uh, joined the armies of the Saxons, joined the armies of Wittekind uh, in uh, defense of the pagan way of life, I suppose, and he died in battle with Charlemagne and uh, Ogier the Dane. Uh, took that personally and conducted seven years of war against Charlemagne. Now, these are in the legends, not in reality. Um, although we do believe that Ogier the Dane was based on an actual person. Um, off Darius, I think. Uh, I'll look at the details later. But um, he uh, was one of Charlemagne's greatest opponents in his early life, and in later life, he had a conversion event and fought valiantly against um, what was it? A Saracen giant, I think. There's a Saracen giant who was uh, knocking down a lot of Charlemagne's knights. Uh, Astolfo of England and uh, a couple of no-names. They're, they were named, but they were of no significance or or in, they had no later appearances. They were just, there was this guy and he was knocked down by a Saracen giant. And there was, oh, there was a Stolfo of England. Uh, a Stolfo was, uh, was a funny one. He was said to be the son of King Otto of England. Um, Otto was very likely inspired by Offa of Mercia. Um, he was uh, was he a thane of Mercia? I don't think he was a king. Um, but anyway, a real historical figure. So um, there was this Astolfo. But Astolfo, although he appears multiple times in multiple songs and other romances, um, is always seen to be kind of ineffectual. Um, it, he was later given a, uh, a magical lance that could unseat anyone, kind of an eye win as kind of a joke, because everybody knew that Astolfo is, uh, he tries, he tries. Um, so Astolfo was uh, defeated by this Saracen giant, and finally Ogier the Dane told Charlie, fine, send me out, coach. And he won, and uh, they were reconciled, and he became part of Charlemagne's court and one of his greatest supporters of the older generation. And somehow this character turned into a um, symbol of Danish nationalism, I suppose, Danish national pride. And so later legends were, uh, no, not later legends, later stories were composed um, about how Ogier the Dane was going to be a um, kind of a chosen one for the Danish culture. And so he was attended by the, the fairy ladies. Um, uh, let's see, this was, no, this was Morgane. Um, <coughs> I forget Orion. I think Orion was in the green. Um, they all have names. And the uh, you would recognize the um, the fairies from Sleeping Beauty uh, were directly taken from these uh, 
fairies that were attending the birth of heroes in chivalric legend. Like that, that didn't just come out of the air. And uh, they weren't initially, you know, the, the fairy ladies weren't initially this hot. They were initially ladies um, and always described as being very beautiful and desirable if mortal humans were ever allowed to see them. So Odier the Vain was attended by uh, these fairies and then he was given gifts as well, uh, exactly like in Sleeping Beauty. Uh, that uh, one would be, one would give him a gift on, uh, I don't remember Odier the Vain's gifts, but this, this scene was recycled in a later proto-novel called um, The Lion in Bruges um, that was set in Carolingian legend. And the lion, literally a guy named Lion, um, <laughs> his, his mother, uh, gosh, it's, His father was a duke and friend of all of the 12 peers of France. He was the nephew of Duke Naaman. Uh, he was baptized by uh, Archbishop uh, Turpin. And um, he had just gotten married and was called to Paris for the grand court. And everyone was there. The 12 peers of France was there. Roland and Oliver and the rest of the, the peers were all there. And they were his contemporaries. He just got married and he wanted to bring his wife with him. And so he uh, was taking a little bit more time. And uh, Ganelon, the villain, the false man, the traitor, uh, Ganelon was a character who was created for the Song of Roland and he was always then used as a stock villain. Um, even though in the Song of Roland it said that he was one of Charlemagne's greatest lords and was a uh, accomplished noble in his own right. He was never shown to be an accomplished noble in any of the later stories. He was always the villain lurking in the background. And um, so Ganelon uh, had a brother, Clarence, uh, who was the king's chamberlain. The king's chamberlain says, you know, there's this lord of Bruges, this Herpin, he's not here. He must not respect your authority and probably doesn't deserve to be the Lord of Bruges anymore, does he? And so some of Herpin's friends tell him, hey, this, the king's chamberlain is talking smack about you. He's saying that you should be stripped of your lands. And so Herpin runs into dinner, finds the chamberlain, says, you liar and slanderer, and draws his sword and splits his head open. Have you heard this one before? So Charlemagne is obviously furious and says, off with his head. And uh, Duke Naaman, his uncle, is not particularly down with that. And uh, Ogier the Dane, one of his good friends, is he, he sends a couple of pages of boys to arrest him and escort him away so that Herpin can escape and run. Um, and Herpin's wife comes in, begs on her knees for uh, Herpin's life from Charlemagne. Uh, Charlemagne is actually is swayed by her uh, beauty and sincerity. And she says that we'll, we'll run away um, and you'll never see us again and every day if you let us go, we will thank God and uh, pray for your help and future successes. And I just go, go, go. So they have to leave. And they leave France, and leave it behind. And they're in the middle of a forest when she was about to give birth. And she said, tells Herpin, go find a woman. I'm going to stay here and sit under this tree. And I'm just going to stay here. You leave, find find someone who has given birth and bring her here. I need help. And Herpin 
um, obediently goes, and he is literally beside himself trying to find uh, any mother who can help his wife. And, uh, but he doesn't find anyone in time. And uh, the Turpin's wife says uh, she prays to, to Mary, Mother Mary, for aid in childbirth. And she gives birth to a beautiful baby boy who has an unusual birthmark of a cross on his, uh, on his breast under his arm. And uh, then she is immediately captured by bandits. And then a lion comes out of the woods and sees the baby and brings the baby back to her den and nurses the baby. And when the baby is, well, child later, is ultimately found by hunters, he is named Lion. And, but uh, while the mother is being dragged away and while the, the lion is coming, uh, the child lion is being attended by these fairies who say that this is, you know, a birth of great moment, of great import. And so um, Orion um, blesses him with, what, how, what is her blessing? I think her blessing is that uh, no, no mortal weapon shall kill him. And uh, then, uh, it's not Titania. Another fairy whose name you would recognize if I, told, if I was able to remember it properly, says uh, that he will also be lucky in love. And then a third fairy um, who's, I wasn't able to catch her name in the translation. It, it didn't come out very well. Uh, but think of the Maleficent character, says that uh, uh, that everything he gains in life, he will ultimately lose. Um, and the, uh, uh, the final queen of the fairies, um, is it Titania? No, it's Morgane. It's Morgane is the, in this version is the queen of the fairies. And she says, uh, what, what, what a terrible blessing. And it's more of a curse. Like, he didn't do anything to you at all. Why would you do that? So she uh, gives a final blessing or, yeah, blessing, gift, gift of the fairies that after his life's work comes undone, he will gain it all back again and more, and his children will be uh, kings and queens of their own right. And so... This was the kind of you know, supernatural event that was, that was said to happen at the births of many of these, of these heroes. Like there was a, uh, a legend where uh, Renault had fairy queens attending his birth. Um, it's in French. I just know that it happened. I, I have not been able to translate it and read it for myself. There's so much cool stuff that I'm not able to read because I don't, read French. It's a, it's a little barrier to entry here. Um, where are we? We're about 8.30. Anybody have any questions? Uh, I'm kind of rambling at this point, so I would prefer to ramble about something that you're interested in. Pop off mute if you like, or just say something in the chat. I'm kicking myself over here because I feel like there's a subject that I really wanted to tell you about, but I've completely forgotten. <clears throat> oh, I remember what it was. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was about plagiarism. Plagiarism in the Middle Ages. Um, 
there were two characters in Carolingian legend that were uh, that I would swear that I had I'd seen elsewhere, and I hadn't, but I had. There were these characters were uh, Florismart and Flordelis. Uh, now, if you translate those names, that's uh, Florismart is battle flower, and Fleur de Lis is the Fleur de Lis, it's the flower of the lily. And so this was a, a knight and his lady, and they loved each other very much. And um, uh, where, did, where did those characters come from? They were just dropped into the middle of this legend because we needed characters. Um, they served a purpose and then they went away and then they popped up a few other times but they had no particular narrative of their own so where did these characters come from they came from a completely different romance um this was the romance of uh let's see so in carolingian legend there were flora smart and flordelis okay uh in their own romance they were floris and blanche fleur Mm -hmm. So, flower and white flower. Um, now, the the romance of Floris and Blanche Fleur is it's not a story that you could really tell today. Um, at least, I don't know, not outside of an adult video, I guess. Um, it's so the, the, the idea is that the king of Spain, the Moorish king of Spain, captures a beautiful Christian woman and uh, makes her a concubine. And uh, this beautiful Christian woman gets pregnant and she delivers this beautiful child, um, Blanche Fleur, on the same day that the queen, the Muslim queen, has a son, Floris. And so Floris and Blanche Fleur are half siblings born on the same day and they grow up um, as playmates. They are, they do everything together, they're running about the palace in beautiful Muslim Spain. Um, but uh, Floris is raised as a Muslim, of course. Blanche Fleur is allowed to follow her mother's faith, uh, who raised her as Christian. Um, this is not considered objectionable at the time. And uh, then uh, when they are, uh, I feel like they're sent off to school. School seems like an odd thing for two nobles to do in the 12th century, but, um, but they're sent off together to be educated. And um, the... Uh, there is concern that they'll get too close and it would be very inappropriate on multiple levels, but uh, they do. They fall completely in love for each other and uh, Floris is sent to, he's sent to Morocco. Uh, uh, like, no, get out of the kingdom, that, nothing to see here, go away, stop. And then Blanche Fleur, is sent to a uh, the the king's harem tower, not to be a, a wife, but to you know live in the harem, protected from boys, protected from boys. Um, and Floris is completely uh, distraught and beside himself uh, because he loves Blanchefleur so much, and so he falls into. Uh, into the orbit of this rogue and cunning man type. Um, sort of a wizard, not really, just more of a clever man. And he says, look, so your girl is inside the harem. The harem was constructed as a magical tower that nobody can get in. You, there's, so there's no way for you to like climb up or to burst your way in, it's, it's impossible. It's completely impregnable. But it does have to be maintenanced. So if you 
go over to Spain in a fishing boat and make friends with the Mason, you might be able to sneak in. So that's exactly what happens. And Flores sneaks into the harem and uh, uh, Flores is, or uh, Blanche Fleur is absolutely over the moon to see him and they make love passionately and uh, then he sneaks out and then he sneaks in again and they make love and then he sneaks out he sneaks in again and they make love and then he's finally caught. They're caught. And uh, Blanche Fleur is going to be uh, executed, I think. I don't remember if she's going to be beheaded or burned at the stake. Uh, don't think about it too hard. What, what Muslims would do, it didn't matter. It wasn't written by Muslims. It was written by Christians about Muslims. Um, but she's going to be executed. And uh, uh, Flores says that you know if she's executed, I'll kill myself. And suddenly, the old king has a heart attack and dies, leaving Floris as king. And so he is thrilled. Now he gets to marry Blanche Fleur. But Blanche Fleur won't marry him uh, unless he converts to Christianity. And if he does, he'll do anything for his love. And so, bam, Muslim Spain is now Christian. And then these half-siblings are married to each other in a we, we just don't we'll talk about that particular familial relationship but that was Flores and Blanche Fleur and so they were copied wholesale and dropped in as Flora Smart and Flora Delis into Carolingian legend okay uh, but there are other instances of other people copying wholesale parts of Carolingian legend and dropping it into something else entirely. Like Shakespeare. Uh, there's, a, there's a character, um, Bradamante. Bradamante is a, is a female knight and I have, I have opinions about Bradamante. Uh, like when I first heard about Bradamante, I'm like, that is so cool. It's a, you know, it's the female knight from Carolingian legend. That's awesome. It's great. Then I, I learned more and more about Carolingian legend. I'm like, did you have to do it that way? Couldn't she have just stood on her own feet? So Bradamante is, uh, is the twin sister of one of the four sons of Anna. We talked about the four sons of Aenon, um, Reynolds, Rickard, Allard, and Giscard, and how they were always on the run from Charlemagne. They, they go back to their, their home, and their home is flattened, and they flee to Mont Alban, and Mont Alban is sieged, and they're always on the run. And even in the later legends, they turn into like hardened mercenary captains, always fighting heathens and scraping by, and having to steal sometimes to have enough to survive against these harsh conditions. Where exactly was their sister in all of this? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, and then she was given a magical lance that was allowed, that allowed her to unseat any enemy. It was, it was the magical I win button that was initially given to uh, Astolfo of England and uh, he lost it. Oddly, just he didn't know what he had. He, th he thought it was all him, and he lost this magical lance. And Blanche, or not Blanche Fleur, um, Bradamante uh, picks it up, and she knows what she's got. And it's like, ah, ha, 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 now I can compete on even footing with any knight. Um, and does. And she, it's, it's actually very cool. She, she is a cool character, legitimately. But she should have just been like like Astolfo's sister, Astolfo's cooler sister. That would have been cool. Or uh, maybe like the daughter of Ogier the Dane or something like that. Because as, as one of, as the daughter of Aemon, as one of the, the siblings of Renault, it's just in the larger myth, it just doesn't fit. But it doesn't matter. Uh, at one point, 
in Bradamante's Adventures, uh, she is uh, asleep under a tree, and a uh, Moorish princess, I don't remember her name, a Moorish princess sees her and thinks that, because she's in armor, uh, thinks that she's a man, and she falls madly in love with him at first sight. Uh, what a gorgeous knight. And uh, Bradamante is, uh, when she wakes up, she's like, ah, 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 no, 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 no. Um, and she explains that she's a woman. That doesn't bother the Moorish princess nearly as much as it ought to. And Bradamante is, is even more squigged out. Like, ah! In fact, she says, she has this line. Um, she put it. She says, when a great grinds on another great, there is no profit. You don't make cheese. And so she, uh, she flees. And uh, when she meets up with her brothers, uh, she's telling them, uh, she, they, uh, they meet up to, to relieve the siege of Paris. And so her brothers are like, you're late. Where were you? And she's like, I was a prisoner of love. And they're like, come again. Well, don't get me too wrong. It was this, uh, this beautiful princess thought I was a man and fell madly in love with her, me and didn't particularly care that I was a woman. And that was weird. So I just left. And her twin, uh, the, the story says identical twin, but we know can't have an identical fraternal twin. But apparently they look a lot like you. There is a uh, Ricardito. Um, Richard, uh, Rickard, is, is meant to be Bradamante's look-alike. Now, if you take this in context with the rest of Carolingian legend, he should be like a mercenary captain in his 30s, having been through countless life and death battles, probably wouldn't look much like his sister anymore. But okay, don't worry about it. Don't turn off your brain. Um, but anyway, uh, Rickard says, so she fell in love with you thinking that you were a man. Where exactly was this? And so off to Spain, forget France, off, forget the siege of Paris. He goes off to Spain to find this beautiful Moorish princess. And uh, <laughs> he finds the beautiful Moorish princess and says, look, I was magically changed into a man by fairies. Uh, isn't it great? Now we can be together. And they are together. Uh, amorously and repeatedly, and they live together as husband and wife for a little while until the Moorish princess uh, is found by her father, who says, I did not approve, I did not consent, and I have an objection. In fact, so strenuous an objection that I'm going to take uh, my daughter's supposed husband and burn him at the stake for this horrible dishonor. And uh, Bradamante had a, a, a Moorish prince that she had fallen in love with named Rogerio. And Rogerio uh, is passing by and sees in this town square what looks like his lady love, Bradamante, being burned at the stake. And so he absolutely murderates everyone in the town square to save Bradamante. He's like, you're free. And uh, Rickard says, yeah, thanks. Uh, to who do I to uh, who? Can you tell me your name? Who who do I have to thank? And <laughs> Rogeri was like, uh, honey. And uh, they explain the situation that they are identical uh, twins. And we know they're not identical. They say that in the text. They are twins. And he's like, oh well, I guess they saved my brother-in-law. Uh, which comes as some surprise to, to Rickard because he didn't know that his sister was seeing anyone, but they roll with it. And that is basically the entire plot. 
this side story in Orlando Furioso is the entire plot of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Uh huh. When I, I read it, I'm like, oh, that's kind of a lot like Victor Victoria, but Victor Victoria is Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, basically. Um, uh, well, no, not exactly, because Victor Victoria, where she was playing both sides and uh, there wasn't an identical twin. But in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, yeah, there was uh, the, the siblings get shipwrecked, the, the sister thinks that her brother is dead, so she impersonates her brother so she can make a way to society. Uh, the beautiful duchess thinks that uh, she, she, playing he, is the most handsome young man ever and falls madly in love with him. Uh, she, playing a he, falls madly in love with the handsome duke whom she has, uh, into whose service she has entered. Uh, then finally, the brother, the actual brother, uh, makes his way onto the scene and is like, fantastic, you go over here, I'll take off the wig, and I'll go over here, and we all live happily ever after. Yes, that was Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. He lifted it almost directly from Orlando Furioso. Huh? That's about all I got, folks. Unless we can come up with a few more interesting things to talk about. Um, I mean, I can talk about swords, I can talk about magic, but uh, I'm out of my own topics. So unless there's something from the gallery, I would like to thank you all for coming tonight. I very much appreciate your time and attention. And uh, uh, I would love to answer any questions you have. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. All right, anything over on Facebook? Um, oh, wait, somebody, somebody had connectivity problems. They're saying, did you? That's Spencer's Fairy Queen? No, I do not know Spencer's Fairy Queen. Um, feel free to unmute and tell me about it, and I can, uh, I can let you know if any of their names were ones that I've seen in uh, reading French legend. Well, thank you. Um, I had never heard these older medieval stories before I'd heard of them, but I've never heard them. But I was surprised to hear about Bradamante and uh, some of the other names of the characters sound really familiar from having attempted to read Spencer's Fairy Queen. I know he's Tudor, but I believe he was influenced and attempting to recreate the tone and style of the older medieval work. So um, when you were talking about fan fiction and how they influenced each other and borrowed from each other, and nowadays we would call that plagiarism, but back then it was people just used each other's same stories as source material. Pretty much. Yep. Like Spencer went back and got some of those older medieval stories to populate his reimagining of Arthur and the, the he, he originally wanted 12 different stories. I think he finally got as far as six, but each night was going to embody a virtue. And the tales were really convoluted and had a lot of side characters and adventures that went off in all directions. So um, next time I attempt Fairy Queen, it'll probably be after I get a little more familiar with some of the centuries older material with characters of the same names. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if you find out that you are exactly right. I know that Bradamante became a very popular character to write uh, operas about. I, I know that there are three operas uh, featuring Bradamante as the, the primary character. Um, Italo Calvino had a sh one of his short stories, I can't remember which one, had Bradamante as a character. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a resurgence of interest in Bradamante um, in uh, 
actually in feminist and LGBT literature um, because of the um, basically the passage that I described in Orlando Furioso, um, where this was a a uh, an early instance of um, sapphic love, I suppose, uh, unrequited ultimately, and that uh, was ultimately uh, substituted for a heterosexual relationship. But, um, you know, when it was presented in the text, it was more like lurid, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah, I suppose, uh, not, not lurid, but humorous and a little bit taboo and kind of hot too. Yeah, something like that. And so there was, there was interest in, you know, people who are studying gender, um, looking at the, the way that it was presented in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And uh, um, there's nothing new under the sun. There, there is nothing new under the sun. Um, She's asking I, who was Bradamante's part, partner? Ruggiero. Ruggiero. Ruggiero was a um, was the son of a Christian knight and Muslim woman, I think. Yes, the son of a shipwrecked Christian knight uh, in Tunisia, and a Muslim woman. The Christian knight died, and uh, I think the Muslim woman was also died, and uh, Ruggiero was adopted by the uh, the Muslim sorcerer Atalante. Sounds a lot like Atlantis. Uh, they were used a lot of names, completely indiscriminately. Yeah. You know, Picking names appropriate to the target culture was not a thing in the Middle Ages, not at all. Um, you'll see that uh, a lot of Muslims have like Italian sounding names. Yeah, Muslim villains have Italian sounding names, but because it was the Italians writing it, they just wrote something exotic ish. Um, but yeah, uh, Ruggiero was raised as a knight by this uh, sorcerer who kept him in a tower and uh, he was raised as a great knight but he wasn't allowed out and um, the what the emir of Babylon and uh, raising an army to uh, invade France knew that uh, that he had this this great knight Pugario, uh who would be potentially a match for Roland, and um, Atalante didn't want to let him go, and so what Ruger or what uh, the Emir of Babylon did was he uh, held a tournament, a gigantic, you know, fantastic deed of arms right at the base of the tower. And Ruggiero is looking down and he's like, this is fantastic. And he leaves and they're like, oh, what a coincidence. Here, have some armor. Here, have a horse. Here, have a lance. Oh, and by the way, we're going off on adventure and besieging France. Would you like to go? Yes, you would. That's great. Let's go before your dad gets back. And uh, so uh, Ruggiero goes off to France and uh, uh, he is uh, he's shown to be a, you know, a model of chivalric virtue. Um, like when, uh, when two Muslims are uh, attacking a single Christian, he will attack one of the Muslims so that it's a fair fight. Uh, or vice versa, uh, if two Christians are teaming up on one Muslim, he will actually he will go and horse them both. Um, and uh, so uh, how did he meet Bradamante? Bradamante, I think, had a horse that one of the kings of Spain desired. And so they were fighting in single combat. And Bradamante, uh, I think this, this may have even been before she had the magic lance. Uh, she uh, 
struck the king of Spain so hard that um, that he was knocked unconscious in the, sa in the saddle. He was not unhorsed, but he was just, you know. And she goes to finish him off, and Ruggiero um, rides in and offers himself as a combatant, and they fight. Um, and then uh, they find themselves separated, and then Ruggiero, looking for this fine combatant, sees her engaged with a gang of Muslims, and so he rides in and fights on the other side, and then, yeah, they, he finds out that she's a girl, they fall in love, she falls in love with him, and at the end, um, you know, they, they are absolutely in love, and he asks Bradamante to marry him, and she says, I want to, but I, can, I cannot marry across faith. Um, if, if we were to be together, you have to be a Christian. And he says, once again, he says, anything for you, my love, and he converts, and they live happily ever after, and um, I think Orlando Furioso ends on a wedding. I think, I think it ends up with their wedding, yeah. So that was, that was Bradamante's partner. Well, with that, I think we have legitimately used up just about all my time. Thank you all again so much. I really appreciate uh, getting to tell these stories. I've been, I've had my nose in um, very old books for about a year and a half now. And uh, it's fun getting to tell people um, some of the stories that I found. Shall we wrap it up? Well, thank you guys for coming. Um, someone's asking if you plan to le learn that old French. No, no. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm actually thinking about finding somebody who knows old French on Fiverr and giving them texts to translate for me. Uh, I think it would be easier for me to make more money and pay someone to do something they already know how to do than learn a completely new and basically useless skill to me. <laughs> right, well, thank you guys. Thank you for teaching. All right, folks. Thank you so much. Good night. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.